You know, God is aware of your every circumstance. He knows you by name. You're not just an indiscriminate person walking this earth. He has a plan for you, and he knows your sorrow. He knows what you're struggling with. We are so excited to talk to our guest today, Shannon Bream, and she is the anchor at Fox News at Night. So she is their chief legal correspondent at the Fox News Channel, which means she has covered many a landmark Supreme Court case, as well as many a heated political campaign and policy changes and issues from the White House to Capitol Hill. She is a number one New York Times bestselling author for the book, Women of the Bible Speak, which is also a excellent five episode documentary online at Fox Nation. Her recent book is called Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak. So we're excited to look into all that today and glad to have you, Shannon, welcome. Thank you, Natalie, it's a treat to be with you. Great. Well, we want to hear your story. So tell us about growing up. Tell us, you know, the impact your parents made on you. And did you learn a lot from them? Absolutely. Um, my mom is the best model of Christ to being the hands and feet. I mean, she's really that person and has modeled that my whole life. Um, my parents split up when I was just a year old. So I grew up as millions of kids and people do in this country and around the world with a divorced family going back and forth between them. And, you know, it was tough as a kid. Uh, my mom was sort of a baby Christian at the time herself. So she was growing in faith and um, growing up too. I mean, she was just in her 20s and there were times that she and I uh, shared a bedroom. Um, we had two twin beds, like sisters, more than mother and daughter at times. Um, but she was always able to um, model for me faith when we were struggling financially or in other ways. She just never doubted God. I mean, we'd have a broken down car or no groceries in the refrigerator. So she always modeled for me deep faith. And she is a prayer warrior. She's one of those people that if she says she's praying for you, um, you believe it, you know it. She's on her knees for you um, before the sun is up. And she's the first one to show up if you have a baby or an emergency or a death in the family. And so she's just modeled the Christian example to me of a Proverbs 31 woman and more uh, my entire life. Um, my father was also a Christian. Um, later in life, he, he grew in his faith. And we were able to have conversations about that as well. He's since passed away. But what a comfort to know that I will see him again. Wow. So likewise, my parents divorced when I was two. So I can understand the pain and suffering that corresponds with that. And I'm so glad that your parents were able to love you and uh, walk you through and, and impact your life in such a positive way. And so to me, it seems like people might think the people in the Bible and the Bible itself would not apply to their life. When did faith and the Bible itself start playing a part in making your life decisions? Mm-hmm. Well, I feel very blessed that I grew up in a Christian home. Um, we were at church all the time. My mom was a Christian school teacher, and I went to that Christian school. So I was hearing the word all the time. I was around a fellowship of believers that were really like, I feel like in many ways, like the early church, especially those early years that my mom and I was just the two of us. They really came alongside us, and we were family. But there came a point where I realized in middle school, I remember being at a summer camp and hearing the messages I'd heard so many times and realizing this has to be a personal decision. I can't just coast kind of on knowing some Bible verses or even being in church every Sunday or that my mom has such a faithful example for me. I have to decide that I believe Christ is my savior. Savior, His sacrifice covers my sins. I have to commit my life to him and accept him in salvation and believe that um, grace and mercy saves me and has saved my soul because of his sacrifice. So I was probably about 12 when I made that decision and made it a personal faith and really began that relationship with Christ. Um, which I think is, for all of us, a series of mountains and valleys, um, times that we're really walking closely with him and getting things right, and other times when you know we get off track and we make bad decisions. But um, what I find so comforting about the Bible and all of those stories tucked in is that God is using them. Even when we are off track, um, he can use our mistakes and our rabbit trails for his good. And we see that in these stories all throughout the Old and New Testament. 
I also hear that you are familiar with suffering, that you had eye pain that was debilitating at night for two years. Yeah, it was such a strange thing. And I got to tell you, this whole thing made me much more empathetic to people who live with chronic illness, um, whether it's a physical ailment, um, you know, mental or emotional trauma or stress on them. Uh, when you're just trying to get through the day, at the, at the end of the worst of this, I really was just trying to survive. It started with waking up in the middle of the night one night, feeling enormous pain in one of my eyes. I didn't think much of it because I thought, how did I injure myself while I was sleeping? A few weeks later, it happens again. Then it starts happening in both eyes. And I went to my doctor and he said, well, you know, women as they age are going to have dryness with their eyes and maybe that's, you know, the problem. Um, but he referred me to a specialist. So I started looking around, found a specialist, went to him. I'm months into this now. And it's become a situation where I have um, enormous pain all the time. I've got double vision, many times triggering migraines. I'm just trying to get through the day and try to find some answers. And that second specialist, I remember he sent me away with a few ideas. And when I came back the next time, I was in a really bad place. I'm over a year probably into it at this point where I'm literally setting alarm clocks for one or two hours at a time so I can wake up and try to put in drops before whatever's happening is happening to my eyes. So I was exhausted all the time, which we all know that exacerbates whatever else in your life that you're struggling with um, when you're exhausted and you're in pain. It's just a toxic combination. And I went back to him and he said to me, as I'm trying to describe everything to him and, and tell him how desperate I am for a diagnosis and for answers, he said to me, you know, you're really emotional. And I was. And that kind of sent me over the cliff for a little bit because I thought, you know, I I need a life preserver. And it's like you've handed me a, a weight to, you know, where I'm sinking and I'm drowning and I, and I can't get out of this. And I remember driving home and thinking, not even a doctor, two doctors now I've been to can help me figure this out. And life became very dark and very hopeless for me because it was just a series of this excruciating pain of waking up, of trying to sleep an hour or two here or there, you know, a full-time job and um, just going through my life and having no words or diagnosis to even share with my family or coworkers or anyone else. So um, he made me think, well, you, you know, you are emotional. I started to question everything. Um, only my husband really knew because he lived with me and went through all those nights with me about exactly how bad it had gotten. And I started looking online. I always say this, that it's not a good idea to try to self-diagnose online, but I was so desperate to find somebody with these same symptoms that would have an understanding or give me a, a word or a name for what this was, that I stumbled upon some chat rooms and people with these exact same things, people being turned away from the emergency room, being told it's in your head, you know, really struggling and being in this enormous pain all the time that life feels pointless. Like I can remember praying to the Lord, like, what is the point of my life if I'm, I'm just surviving literally sometimes minute to minute, hour to hour, there's no joy in my life. I, I'm closed off from everyone but my husband. I'm just trying to get through one day at a time. And I'm reading these chat rooms and there were people who said that they were considering ending their lives. It's And it didn't strike me as crazy. I thought, that sounds like such a relief. And I actually started to talk through those things myself with God saying, you know more than anyone what this struggle is like for me. And I know that you would understand. And, and then I started to think about my family. Well, would they understand? Would would they know that this enormous pain that I'm in all the time, now emotionally and physically? Um, and the more I started to have that conversation with me, there was there was something in me, and, and maybe it was the Holy Spirit prompted me, I knew that was not right. That was not the right solution. And I went and leveled with my husband and just poured it out. He knew how much I was suffering. And I said, you know, this idea of just going to sleep and not waking up, like it sounds great and I need help, you know? And so he said, listen, we're gonna drop everything. We're going to find some answers. I'd given up on doctors after that second one. So um, he said, let's try again. Let's find a new doctor. We're gonna just start from scratch. And I remember praying, Lord, if it's like in Corinthians where, you know, Paul's got this thorn in the flesh and we don't know what it was. Everybody wants to debate that, but it clearly he begged God for relief from that. I prayed, I said, Lord, if your will is not to heal me from this, all I'm asking for is that you get me to the right doctor, somebody who can help me live with this. If you're not going to heal me, which is my prayer, but I understand it's not always your will. And um, I said, just get me through this night. And I remember getting up the next day and starting to call around to doctors' offices. And I found this one doctor who was identified as this amazing cornea specialist. And um, I called and I said, you know, can I get in? I know he's he's very popular. I don't know if he has any openings. And they said can you hold on a minute? And the nurse came back or the receptionist came back and said, I had a cancellation tomorrow. Can you come? 
And I said, yes, I will. And I left work that next day and um, went there. And the doctor, before he even examined me, I told him the story, I know what you have. And I had this enormous weight that felt like a two-year weight off of my shoulders. It was the first time I, I felt hopeful in two years. And I thought, I forgot what this felt like. And um, he went through the exam, it confirmed the diagnosis, and, and essentially I have a genetic condition that there isn't a cure for. You can manage it, which he's done very well for me. Um, but that was what he told me at the end of the appointment. By the way, you should know there's no cure. And that sent me out of the office again, you know, just in tears in my car. And I can remember, I don't, I'm not somebody who feels like I've audibly heard the Lord say something to me, but I felt very clearly in my spirit as I was praying in the car that he said to me, I will be with you. Not that I'm going to heal you. I'm going to take this away, but I will be with you. And what greater comfort could we have than that? Yeah. Wow. That I know there are so many people watching that can identify and that speaks to them and helps them. Thank you for you know being willing to share that and that you're walking through it. So obviously God helped you in that, but also are you better now? Mm -hmm. I am. Um, I continue to, to struggle with this for a few more years as we tried several different things. And there was a surgery that my doctor said, you know, it's not guaranteed that it would work, but it's the closest thing that we have to a cure. And it works for a lot of people. Um, it's, it, it's a difficult process. Um, but he said, you'll know when you get there, when we found out we've exhausted every other option. So about seven years into working with him, um, he did this surgery for me. And um, I talked about that too. The recovery was very, very difficult. I didn't have my vision back for a while, which is scary when you're, I don't like being vulnerable, which sometimes the Lord says, you're going to be vulnerable. And then this is the circumstance you're going to walk through. And he really was the only thing I had during that time. It was, I couldn't drive. Um, it was tough to, to read or work on my computer, do anything. I, I just felt helpless. And there was a lesson in that too. But on the other side, it turned out for me that once I got healed up, the surgery was a great success for me. And I'd say 95, 98% of the time I am pain free. And I thank God every time that I look around and I can you know, read a street sign or I see a bird or I just can drive my car, I think, God, please never let me forget to be grateful for how far you've brought me. Wow. Do you have something that you can say to people that are suffering or you know, uh, suicide and depression is you know, escalating and epidemic, they say, even before coronavirus. What can you tell them to encourage them? You know, God is aware of your every circumstance. He knows you by name. You're not just an indiscriminate person walking this earth. He has a plan for you, and he knows your sorrow. He knows what you're struggling with. I would also say, I mean, there have been times I've turned to professionals for help. I mean, many churches have counselors there. Um, there are great counselors outside of your church or your, you know, your house of worship. Please, please reach out. That conversation I had with my husband where I told him what I had been considering was so hard for me to be that open and that vulnerable. But um, there are people in your life who are waiting there to help you and would be probably surprised to know how much you're hurting. So please do not be afraid to get help, but know that God sees you in every minute of it. Um, there's no shame at all. It is only a good thing to reach out for help and to get some perspective. And, you know, for some people, um, that's a medical issue. For some, um, it's mental health issues. Sometimes it's a combination. But we have so many good options now that I would just urge you um, to take that really tough step of just reaching out to one person. Absolutely. That's so true. And, and do grow closer to God. It is just amazing how he can heal, like you were saying emotionally and give us comfort that we just can't even imagine, you know, his peace. I, I agree, call a safe source, they say, uh, and get help. That's, that's such good words. God is love and love comes from God. In 1 John, the Bible tells us that God is not only all loving, but that he actually is love itself. The heart of the Parent Compass television show is to bring the transforming love of God to families everywhere. In every Parent Compass episode, true stories reveal family struggles and how their lives were radically changed by the love of God. Parent Compass, an award-winning television series, is completely funded by people like you. If you have been touched by God and you want to share God's love to others, would you please pass it on? Jesus tells us to go into all the world and to tell about Him. 
With your donation, you allow us to take this television show into many different nations and in many different languages, free of charge. And a portion of your donation goes to Parent Compass Outreach to feed starving children. Your gift does so much. To make your tax deductible gift, go to parentcompass.tv forward slash donate. That's parentcompass.tv forward slash donate. And thank you for sending love and hope around the world.